Chavez first grew to enormous popularity in 1992, of course, after the unsuccessful attempt at overthrowing the government back then. Describe Venezuela prior to the Bolivarian Revolution. What created such conditions for this? How did Chavez win the hearts and minds of the people? Well, it's hard to know where, where to begin. I mean, people often begin with 1989, which was the Caracaso, the kind of uprising, which actually didn't begin in Caracas, but it ended up with that name. It was an uprising against neoliberalism, you could say. I mean, in all of Latin America in the 80s, they applied neoliberal uh, packages, we call them, structural adjustments and things like that. And it's interesting that it happened the same year as the Berlin Wall came down. So in one moment in which neoliberalism or capitalism is advancing, uh, it's also, there's rebellions here. And then, of course, another famous rebellion is the Zapatista one. But that was a terrible event, essentially. I mean, people rose up because of lack of food. The thing that actually sparked it was bus fares. Uh, Carlos Andres Perez, who was a, you know, a social democratic president, social democratic is always something that seems f closer and closer to hell, frankly. <laughs> I mean, closer and closer to simply a right winger. And uh, he was elected, people thought he would do something positive for the country because there had been a boom in his first presidency. But he's, to people's surprise, maybe they shouldn't have been so surprised, he implemented a structural adjustments package and people rebelled against it. And there was a terrible repression. They put a, um, a state of uh, siege in the, in the city. They suspended people's rights. And probably 4,000 people were killed in a few days. Uh, no one really knows how many. That's another impressive and terrible thing. And so that kind of, that was a spark. I mean. I think that Chavez had been developing a, a, a movement, a, a conspiracy movement in the uh, army for some time, but that certainly put the accelerator on the thing. And then three years later, it's an event that you referred to the, in the failed uh, military uprising in 1992, which led to this famous speech called Por Ahora. Now we call it Por Ahora because Chavez said, well, we failed to achieve our objectives, Por Ahora, meaning that he would try to achieve them through another means. So he went to, the, to prison and he immediately became a, a uh, reference. You know, apparently, right afterwards, there was Carnival and kids dressed up as Chavez in the, in the streets. So he became this kind of reference. Some people say there was a popular movement without leadership in 1989, and then in 1992, there was a leadership without a popular movement behind it, which is why the military uprising failed. And so from there, Chavez, when Chavez got out of prison, partly through a deal with the, the Communist Party, supported uh, the elections of Rafael Caldera, who was a Christian Democrat um, leader to the presidency with the promise that Chavez would be taken out of prison. So Chavez came out, of, this is the Communist Party's project, no? And so uh, that's how Chavez got out of prison. Chavez initially didn't think he would go for elections. He thought he would stay in some kind of extra electoral mode, but he eventually decided to go for elections and he won a rather uh, significant victory in 1998. And that's how he became president. Mm. And when he did win the presidential election, it was dubbed the Bolivarian Revolution, not the Chavez Revolution. How was his movement just an extension of Simón Bolívar? Well, that's one thing that I, I'm interested in because I think a lot of people think that that's just kind of ornament in the whole thing. Bolivar, Simón Bolívar is just ornament, no? Simón Bolívar was the liberator of the Americas, a person born in Venezuela. It would be incorrect to call him Venezuelan because he, at that time there was no Venezuela. I mean, Venezuela was the Capitania. Uh, in the in the larger Latin American nation, you could call it, uh, and uh, he led this independence struggle uh, that uh, ended up with the help of the other important, most important leader, San Martin from what's today Argentina, and they together they lim liberated the continent from the width of giant mass movement. That is a fascinating process. One thing that no one ever tells, no one really has an interest, or almost nobody has an interest in telling a story about the Venezuelan Revolution, which is different from other rev independence revolutions in the continent, with the exception of the uh, Haitian one, is it was actually a social revolution. Not so much thanks to Bolivar, though Bolivar partic 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 participated in a semi-social semi revolution later on, but there was a social counter, well, it wasn't a counter-revolution, but there was a socialist rebellion in Venezuela led by uh, Thomas Boves, and that, uh, he was a re royal royalist. But his followers, all they wanted was to be free. They were slaves, they were peons and things like that. And that's, they actually turned the tables in Venezuela. And that's why Venezuela is a much more mestizo country than other countries in this area. And that's why Venezuela also doesn't have much of a sense of happily is free from a hierarchical concept. But the most important thing about Bolivar is that Bolivar's whole project, which was a project that came to have, not initially, but it came to have a socially emancipatory dimension. No? He talked about freeing the slaves, so he never achieved it. And he talked, and he became a popular leader, a popular caudillo, but it failed. That's the most important thing: is 
the bigger project of Bolivar failed. So the most important thing is that Chavez wanted to take up that project again and continue it. That's a model of a lot of revolutions. In some sense, it's a model of the Cuban Revolution, because the Cuban Revolution, when, when, uh, when Fidel Castro assaulted the Moncada barracks, he said, the intellectual author for this act is Jose Marti, which is the Cuban prosser who 100 years ago, or a little more than 100 years ago, had, had been born and had developed the idea of and developed the first revolutionary party in Cuba. So this idea of picking up an older struggle and taking it forward, frankly, I think that's the only way to do an authentic revolution, to um, pick up an earlier struggle which has a long roots, deep roots in a society and go forward with it. And that's what Chavez proposed to do. And so it was correctly called the Bolivarian Revolution. I think it's much more important to think the socialist element is a consequence of the Bolivarianism, but it's extremely important to keep the Bolivarian roots to the revolution. And you talk about the move between rejecting neoliberalism to rejecting imperialism to embracing socialism. Talk about that trajectory. Sure, I think it's important that it was an organic process, right? Just as I believe in an authentic revolution or a possible revolution, because a possible revolution has to have a massive following. So you can't just pull it out of your hat and say, look, here's my revolutionary project. No, it has to have deep roots in a society. And then it's important that there be an organic process, right, that leads from initial solving of problems, right? I imagine that a revolution uh, Perhaps it uh, uh, seems like an extravagant reference, but there's a Paul Clay painting that's the angel of, that, that Walter Benjamin called the angel of history, right? And it's this angel that supposedly looks at the ruins of history. I think it's an important idea that a revolution should look at the ruins of history, the terrible tragedy, the genocide of Latin America that's existed in Latin America, and then from that try to begin to solve it. But there has to be an organic process that mediates between those different elements, you know, in which you realize that solving these problems is 500 years of of social disaster, of social uh, domination, no do imperialist colonial domination, that the only way to solve that is being anti-imperialist and then later a socialist, no? But it's important that that be an organic process that leads to this kind of strategic goal, which is in a very brief manner you could call socialism or communism. Mm -hmm. You know, many people in the U.S., including supporters of the Bolivarian Revolution, simply recognize the social achievements of Chavez, uh, housing projects, uh, health care, et cetera. But a big significant change, which you talk a lot about, are the colectivos, this kind of self-empowerment of the barrios. How, what, talk more about how this worked and how did he empower communities to advance and defend themselves? Well, you could say like empowering people, right, is almost like oxymoronic, right, because you can't force people to be free, right? So even in the case of, you mentioned the colectivos, the colectivo is what is a popular form of organization, often armed, you know, fortunately, I would say, because there's uh, a lot of, because it's necessary, a lot of them arm themselves initially to combat drugs uh, in, the, in their communities. Uh, sometimes drugs that have a, actually, unfortunately, involve police, the police are involved in it. So people have to arm themselves to liberate their community from drugs. But that's an organic form of, that's existed much before the process, it's not a product of the process. It's actually a specific condition that's part of Latin American urbanism and the resistance to its problems. But then there's these different elements, an attempt to form grassroots organizations, foster them. You can't really make them by fiat, right? So you have to foster them. And that, here there's been a very interesting process. One of the, there, were, there, there are moments in that process that are almost forgotten now. Like there are things called the, the, the Committees of Water Organization, Mesas Técnicas de Trabajo de Agua, creo. And they were attempts to solve the water problems, which are often like uh, sewage water and also getting drinkable water to the barrios. Um, so, and then there was an, also the Consejo Comunales, which started in 2005. These are community councils. They were successful, interesting project. And then from that, there was an effort to form the communes. And the commune is a fascinating proposal that never really, hasn't really gotten off the ground the way it should be. But I believe that was Chavez's key strategic plan, no? He, from, we talked about how he began with uh, an anti-neoliberal an anti project, which you could, anti-neoliberal is a big word, you could say, trying to solve the problems that were at hand, no? Uh, you have to solve the social problems that are at hand. And then the anti-imperialist one, and then the socialist one. But the socialist one came to have a very uh, articulated content, and that content involved the commune. And the commune was to be a form of grassroots democracy, but it was also supposed to be productive. It's supposed to take over part of national production and ultimately form a communal state, which is an interesting idea. It's kind of a forgotten chapter of Marxism. Most people think that Marxist idea was taking state power, which is correct. But at a certain point, Marx thought there, there should be a communal state. He kind of revised his ideas and developed a, uh, this idea that a commune, partly based on the Paris commune and partly through his knowledge of Russian communes, Russian agrarian communes, Marx thought that 
that it could be a communal state. And it's interesting that Chavez, I don't know if it was because he knew about Marx's idea, I think it was more an authentic construction of his own, that the commune could be this political and economic unit that would be a step towards socialism. And talk more about how they, they've worked and, and I guess the shortcomings today of them that you've written about. Sure. Uh, of course, they've, been, they've worked. To say they've worked and not worked, in what sense have they worked? Apparently, there's 1,500 communes that are registered, and there are communes that actually work and produce things that are both political and economic units. There's one here actually in, uh, in Caracas called uh, El Panal, the Beehive, and it's uh, the project of, in some degree, of Alexis Vive, which is a colectivo, initially a colectivo in Ventitres de Nero, which is a large barrio here. Um, there's also a very functional, um, I'm just mentioning a few, there's mm -hmm. a very functional one in the Lara state called uh, El Maizal, the maize grove or something like that, the corn grove. And they produce lots and lots of corn, so it would be false to say they haven't really taken off. But what you could s unfortunately, they're in a very adverse situation. Unfortunately, the capitalist, this is a capitalist economy. Uh, it continues to be a capitalist economy. And unfortunately, the capitalist sector, capitalism is extremely dynamic, you know? That's its, both its curse, it's principally its curse, but it's also in some sense, it's been its blessing, you know? The capacity to grow aggressively. Right now, the aggressive element is much more noticeable than any positive elements, but capitalism here is aggressive. It lo it's managed to bring down a lot of these socialist projects by corrupting them in some way or another. I don't mean a corruption through a conspiracy, but just kind of like the capitalist environment ends up eating up the socialist experiment. So one of my theses is that there is actually a kind of error here. There's, it's true that you can't impose socialism, not that if you want to, I'm, if you wanted to impose socialism, if you wanted to say, well, we're going to collectivize people, like it or don't. But you can't really do that because it's like saying they have to emancipate themselves, but you can't make people emancipate themselves. You can't, you can only encourage people to assume a superior form of social organization. So that's what Chavez tried to do. He tried to encourage people, but at the same time, and this is what I believe is the error, it's simple of course to say this is an error, but uh, it's simple with hindsight, but, right? But the error was to let the capitalist economy kind of have such free reign. I believe that you could form a strong state and a strong party to form a strong state, an effective party to and a strong state that would foster the communes. In other words, kind of like stack the deck in favor of the communes. And let's talk about the opposition. Uh, you mentioned this fascistic uprising. You know, of course, again, the U.S. government media is spending all of its time focusing on this harsh repression um, on behalf of Maduro, this dictatorial repression against the right to protest. You've argued that the government hasn't done enough to actually deal with, with this fascistic uprising and the opposition. The question is, who brought this to, to happen, right? And uh, it's obviously something that the, if you think about it, what country in the world do manif people go into their manifestations and they throw Molotov cocktails? Uh, I've never heard of such a thing in the global north, right? Um, and the uh, people, manifestations are repressed quite uh, strongly in, in the global north, even when that doesn't happen. So if people were throwing Molotov cocktails and burning burning up the city around them, uh, I think there would be a different kind of response in, in the North. It's terrible that these people have died. Uh, the other thing that is um, important to keep in mind is that um, just the, the overall perspective, right? Not only did they decide to, to make a manifestation, it's perfectly acceptable that they, they, manif they do manifestations, uh, but I think it's important to realize that for example, they believe that it's the constitutional, that some kind of constitutional thread has been, there's been a rupture of the constitutional thread, and that's why they say, or the constitutional continu continuity, and that's why, that's one of their big uh, complaints that drives them to the streets. But it's interesting that they behaved in exactly the same way in 2014, right after there had been an election that they lost. And also they behaved in a quite similar way. They assaulted the Cuban embassy and said that people in the, many of the same people, right, many of the same leaders, assaulted the Cuban embassy and said that people inside would, would have to die and, and eat the carpets uh, and they would cut off the water and starve them in the Cuban embassy in 2002, when they themselves had clearly broken the constitutional um, continuity. They themselves, in 2002, took power and they, there's a famous image of, of, it's not Pedro Carmona himself, but some assistant of his saying, and now we're going to throw aside the constitution and now we're going to throw away the people's constitutional rights and everybody's they're cheering like this. So they themselves clearly in 2002 acted in the same way. I think that's obviously, this is a, basically a question of a large class struggle, and I would say the most important thing for people to keep in mind is that some 20 years ago, a large sector, the majority of the Venezuelan population, basically declared that it exist, existed politically. It declared that it wasn't, with Chavez accompanying them, right? It declared that we are 
we are agents, political agents, we are human beings in charge of our country. And I don't think anyone can, can, can see positively a movement that decide, wants to displace the majority of the Venezuelan population from, its, from s occupying its place in history. And that's basically what the opposition wants to do. I think that the whole thing in the streets is a terrible theater of cruelty that they've invented, they have invented. It's a terrible form of blood sport that they've invented. But they do it really just simply to, to distract in a way because their real political project is other. If you think about it, like manifestations in history, these are different, people think, you know, like what they call a guaremba here. They think it's some kind of connection with a barricade of the 19th century, you know. In France, throughout the 19th century, there were barricades that were constructed in the city. But that was a very different form of, form of struggle, right? At that point, it was real struggle. People used, on both sides, used all the firepower they had, and it wasn't essentially a question of media, right? This is something that's created for the media, and it's basically supposed to distract and make a spark that's lead to some intervention or something like that. And really, uh, it needs to be ended. Now, one thing that the government could do that it really hasn't done enough of, in my opinion, is simply follow these people, not take them on the march, but follow them to their homes and put them in jail. Because that would, there's a small sector that are actually, a uh, relatively small sector that are actually the most violent ones. You can see them come out with their shields day after day, and they're easy to identify. And it would be good for their own interests if they were put in jail. And that would kind of bring down the level of, of violence in the streets. It's interesting because in the U.S. we have over 200 people, including journalists, who are facing felony charges uh, on riot, conspiracy to riot, uh, for one or two broken windows at, at the J20 inauguration. And it's just astounding that these people are facing 20 years in prison. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the U.S. press dares to call what's going on here a dictatorial repression um, and brutality. I mean, I was, I was in the middle of one of these manifestations and I saw it firsthand. They said, only film the violent response. It was clear that they were provoking a violent response from the military. And the night that we were out, there were no arrests, which was astounding to me after seeing them burning down the highways and pulling people out of cars and using these vehicles to block highways. Talk about kind of what they've done. Like, what is the nature of the opposition? Because it's not just, obviously, these, these people that are out there on the streets. It's, it's a broad coalition. But why do they allow these people to represent them? Well, I think, like, we could say they're, in, they're the um, image in the mirror of some... I mean, in, le in the left, people... In the left, we... Those of us who are in the left, we believe that in pursuing different forms of struggle, right? Often a left movement will have an armed dimension and a political dimension. I mean, in Vietnam, for example, the Vietnamese movement that was ultimately successful, they had Ho Chi Minh as the political leader, and they also had uh, an armed movement, separate branches of it, right? And the right wing does the same thing, right? Uh, often, but their violence is, is quite a bit, not only are they in the wrong, <laughs> but they're off usually quite a bit more violent than the, quite a bit more violent and quite a bit more cruel than, than the left has been. The left normally pursues clear political objectives, whereas this violence is extremely erratic, right? They seem quite as willing to kill their own people. Uh, just to make a, uh, and then they'll, they'll put the blame on someone else. The, the Pacific side of the opposition, the MUD, you know, I think it's important to point out that they can put a lot of people in the street, right? The MUD can put a lot of people in the street in Caracas, in the big cities. Venezuela is not exceptional, right? Because the big cities are full of people who tend to be richer. So not surprising they can put a fair number of people in the streets. And all those people, the majority of them perhaps are not violent. But there is an organic relation between the whole movement and the, and the violence they permit. You can, people, you know, in, the, in our media, they point to Freddy Guevara meeting with the leaders of the Guaremba, and that's important. But you really don't need to see that to understand it to be the case, right? Essentially, it's a coordinated thing, and they use this kind of armed struggle to achieve their goals. Um, and it's been successful quite often. For example, in 2014, they managed to get very strong, uh, very favorable concessions from the government using a kind of violent street tactics like this. They learn from their own mistakes sometimes, and they adjust their strategy accordingly. Uh, for example, this whole movement probably has its, the counter-revolutionary movement right now probably has its deepest roots in the 2007 student movement. There was a student movement, that right-wing student movement, that emerged in response to the uh, Chavez's first attempt to put it social, you know, to move socialism as a program, his first attempt to readjust the mediatic spectrum a bit, and uh, then there came this counter-revolutionary student movement. That actually was one of the opposition's first successes. And they kind of go on recre recreating that. But one of the craziest things is they, uh, they talk about civil disobedience, right? I always think uh, they're disobedient. Would that they were civil. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they really, uh, they never were very civil. 
and their increasing their their civility is 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 ever is always a lot less. It, you mentioned that uh, it's interesting that in 2014 this happened right after a huge election. Yes, Maduro won by a, a razor-thin margin, but it was still a fair election. I mean, Jimmy Carter, the Jimmy Carter Center said Venezuela has among the fairest elections in the world. Now the demands seem odd because it seems like it's contradictory. They're calling to oust the dictator and also for new elections. So which is it? Is it a dictatorship or do they just want elections sooner? But they are fair elections. I mean, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, it certainly seems to be. I mean, you could imagine those are those are different fractions of the opposition, but they probably just kind of pursue an irrational. They probably throw a lot of irrational things together in a bag. I mean, if you want a, a clear example that it, essentially a rational, contradictory proposal can be elected, can be promoted and win political space, Trump. <laughs> I mean, Trump threw a thousand ideas, gen, almost exclusively bad ones, in the air, and everyone, but many of them contradictory. Among themselves, so a contradictory doesn't doesn't isn't necessarily a failing, when, especially when you're not in power. So I think that they, it's true that this this government has one of the best records as a democracy that you can have, right? It's an extremely transparent, advanced electoral system, and it's not true that, it, that it's always fallen in favor of Chavismo. So they actually know that electoral electoral option is a pretty good one for them, but there's complicated things, right? I think the case of Brazil. In Brazil, you can see how, up till now, <laughs> up till the last two weeks, the semi, the the non, the fact that Temer arrived to power through non-electoral means actually favors his situation in some ways, as far as his relation to capitalism. He has a freer hand as far as putting in adjustments. Or up, up until now, recently there's begun a, a strong resistance. So I think there is some part of the opposition thinks we'd be better off arriving to power through a non-electoral means, and that would give us a freer hand, a, more of a tabula rasa in implementing the rather horrible things they have in their sleeves. Why do you argue that it's critical for socialists, leftists in the United States and around the world to support the Bolivarian Revolution and prevent the ouster of the Maduro government? Sure, I mean, I understand it's confusing territory, right? The media makes it very confusing. And they manage to confuse issues quite using all the, the tools they have in their favor. But I think the most important thing to point out is that this is an authentic revolution that has profound roots, that expresses a desire of the of the majority of a population, and as a secular project, I mean a project with deep roots, that uh, that is a tremendous achievement. And whatever the failings of the current government, in some way or another, the the government is the authentic, even though it has many failings, and even though the thread often seems thin between it and the popular movement, it is the representative of that movement. So to simply say that this giant process will be cast aside because of a few things that are being thrown around the media incorrectly, and they don't really point to the real issues. What are the real issues here? The real issue is that a, a giant group of poor, pe principally poor people, principally mestizos, right, fence, faced with a gr small group of rich people who are principally white and believe in their whiteness, a great many of them, they want to restore and silence these people forever. I think that no one in their right mind could want to see that happening. So let's talk about the opposition. If they did get in power, what, what would their program look like? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, that's a good question, and, I, and no one knows exactly what they would do. But I think the most important thing you can say about the opposition is that they want to silence people. I mean, I think you can say that there's a question of to being or not to be, right? The Venezuelan people, the majority of the Venezuelan people have said they want to be. And the, and the opposition wants them not to be, wants them to crawl into their holes and be silent and step outside of history and not exist any longer. I think that's the most horrible thing. Now, what particular car color it will have, what particular characteristics, whether it will just involve judicial prosecution or whether it, will just in, whether it could actually be something more dictatorial and fascist, that's a bit up in the air, um, and I, no one knows what that would. What, and that could happen. Things like that could happen. Historically, when there's a counter-revolution, has happened in Chile. You know, after three years of the Allende government, that was one of the most horrible counter-revolutions we've seen. And then, you know, just the rollback of the Soviet process was a horrible process of what Naomi Klein calls shock treatment. No, and that has is extremely destructive, almost genocidal in many respects. So whether it's you know Pacific in the in the in the, in the Soviet rollback form, or more violent the Pinochet form, it's almost as equally. I mean, they're they're both quite awful possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing with Trump, where it seems like he's unraveling all these kind of meager uh, gains <laughs> that have happened over the last twenty years, and it's happening very quickly. It could happen quick, uh, the rollback of these social programs. Yeah. Sure. Also, also Venezuela. I mean, the Caribbean's the Caribbean has produced very dynamic societies, and I think. Rollbacks can be the reversibility is quite um, uh, 
quite a possibility in a dynamic society like this one. But the positive side actually is you won't quickly, you won't easily get people to forget the Chavez legacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Chavez, the Chavez legacy, which I say Chavez is like a, it's like a, a term that should cover the whole popular movement. I think it's important to remember this is a giant popular movement with a popular effervescence that affected people and it was an extraordinary thing to see and it's captured in some films but it's hard to capture in the history books in which people really rose up and they took things into their own hands and there was a new way of making, as Chase says, I think, uh, the extraordinary became quotidian or became ordinary. That happened, you're not going to erase that from people. People are not going to step outside of the main, step outside of history once they've entered into it like that.